Hello, welcome to the Bible study. My name is Kent Philpott. I'm pastor of Miller Avenue Baptist Church in Mill Valley, California, in my 36th year there. And we are doing the Bible study, Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 19, verses 17 to 27. I know the lighting is not good. Uh, we uh, are not able to be in the studio. I'm running TV, doing it at home uh, with uh, the best week thing we got going, so we're going to do it. The program, this, the passage is called The Crucifixion. The Crucifixion. It's very interesting that the centerpiece of Christianity is have to do with a cross, an instrument of execution. But that's what it is. Uh, by the way, crucifixion was invented someplace around the 8th century BCE. Uh, was The Greeks used it. The Romans uh, used it. And there were uh, three different kind of crosses. Uh, there was St. Andrew's cross, which was an X. St. Andrew's cross. And then St. Anthony's cross was a T, like a capital T. Here's the stake, the saruo, and then the cross beam, the patabulum. And then the Latin cross was like a small T, which is the cross that you normally see. But there's all kinds of different crosses. But anyway, those are the three primary ones. So we have uh, a faith that's all built around uh, someone dying as a criminal on a Roman cross. Very interesting. And uh, so our, our core message, the core message of Christianity is that Messiah, Son of God, Jesus, was crucified, put to death on a cross. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> all of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, mention, of course, deal with the cross. John's is the shortest of all of the four. Um, and also, John does not tell us about Simon of Cyrene. Uh, and he does not, John does not tell us about the scourging that occurred prior to the crucifixion. The other gospel writers, I, two of them at least, mention it. And that, that scourging was very brutal. People died from it. They had a paddle with long leather straps, pieces of metal or bone were at the end, they threw it over, the person was bound to a particular column, and bareback, probably naked, and this wrecked over it. It opened up bones, uh, and many times people died. It was, um, it was the, the, the crucifixion in the Roman style uh, with the scourging was uh, absolutely horrific. All right, um, so we've talked about that. Uh, I want to mention something about the staruo, the the uh, the um, the cross. Staruo means stake, uh, and <clears throat> very interestingly, uh, you know, I I have I have nothing against these folks, but they have a, an error. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses uh, they say that uh, Jesus was not did not die in a cross, but a stake. Oh, complete misunderstanding. The staruo. Uh, was the stake. It was often left at the site of the execution. It was just there, always there. Crosses were there, right there. Um, and then the condemned carried the crossbeam. And the word for that is, I hope I pronounce it right, uh, the uh, pat yeah, patabulum, P-A-T-I-B-U-L-U-M in Latin. And the convict, the condemned, was would be... Uh, to had to carry that, uh, and um, and so that's what happened. And Jesus, when it says carried the cross, the saru, that it was a, that was the name for the whole of the thing. And uh, uh, because of the scourging, he fell. And one Simon of Cyrene picked it up and carried it for him, but uh, uh, again, not mentioned by um, by uh, John. So. Um, I think we'll start now into the text. 
uh, beginning with uh, verse, well, 16b. A little story I have to tell you. This story begins, it has four words. So they took Jesus, and then, and then we have verse 17. I actually just read the last section of chapter of verse 16. Uh, what happened was, now you'll find this in a number of places in, in, the, in the scripture. The story is the guy who made the, the chapter and the, uh, the verse um, said where they were uh, would, would be riding in a chariot, a whole, uh, some kind of thing like a stagecoach. This is hundreds and hundreds of years ago before King James. And with there were a bump, or something, he'd make a mark there, and it, sometimes he missed, didn't do it right. This is one of those cases. The very end of 16 says, so they took Jesus, but then it goes on in 17, and he went out bearing his cross, the word is saruo, the cross beam, to the place called the place of the skull, and that word in the Greek is Karaniu, and in Latin is cranium, uh, or your cranium, your head, the place of the skull. Some said, well, it, the place looked like a skull, or there were skulls left there. Uh, what the Romans would typically do, uh, they would not bury the body. They'd leave it there uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the vultures. And those are fierce birds. We have a lot of them around here. I see turkey vultures every single day flying around here. And they would just leave the bodies there. They wouldn't take them down. Uh, it was just part of the humiliation uh, for family and friends. Say, okay, here he is. Um, so the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Golgotha. Now, the Latin equivalent of Golgotha is Calvary. Calvary, and you'll find the word Calvary a lot uh, in um, uh, in all kinds of places. Names of a, a of a church uh, that was started by Chuck Smith back in um, the nineteen late early nineteen seventies, and uh, so Calvary, Golgotha. Uh, this is the place where Jesus was crucified. Verse eighteen, there they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Now, there's a passage of scripture, Isaiah 53, 12, says he was numbered with the transgressors, in reference to the Messiah, 750 year, 750 BCE, uh, numbered with the transgressors. Uh, very interesting. There is a canon Lydon is his name, Canon Lydon. I don't know when he lived, but he was an archaeologist, and he looked at the Hebrew Bible uh, from Genesis to Chronicles, or uh, in our last book, uh, in, in our, in our um, and said there were 332 direct uh, uh, references um, of prophetic references uh, to Jesus and the cross and the whole Christian thing, 332. Um, so here's one of them, Isaiah 53, 12, numbered with the transgressors. Uh, and they put Jesus in the middle. It's interesting. Uh, and we don't know who did this. Pilate had to have done this. No, the Jewish authorities could not have done this. Pilate had to have done this. And why he did that has been subject to uh, for a lot of speculation over the years. Uh, I don't have any idea. Okay. Verse 19. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. That's a, a titulus or title when it breaks down into English. Titulus is the word for inscriptions. is writing. And they would place it upon the cross. By the way, Jesus was not very high off the ground. Uh, maybe, maybe a foot, maybe two feet of off the ground. It was it was right there, close. It wasn't very high up. And so here's the inscription. It read, 
Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they talk about this, but they don't use the term of Nazareth. It's just Jesus, the King of the Jews. But John was there. He's the only one of the gospel writers who was there. And he could see what it was. And it was Jesus of Nazareth, all in capital letters, the King of the Jews. So uh, that uh, just a, just an interesting interesting little point uh, that we, we have because we, we know that John was an eyewitness. Okay, verse 20. <clears throat> Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Uh, this would have been, um, uh, as people were coming in from the north, into uh, Jerusalem for Passover. And by the hundreds of thousands, they would come from the east and the west, some from the south. But this was the, the main thoroughfare because, you know, the Mediterranean world was north. And so um, uh, so he was crucified there. And so uh, here came people in. And by the way, the placing of this placard was, was very common. Now, um, John says it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and Greek. Now, Latin, uh, Aramaic would have been the national language. Most Jewish people would have spoken Aramaic. Anybody in Judea area would have been speaking Aramaic. Then in Latin, that was the official language. Uh, that would have been the language used the, by, by the Roman government, Latin, and by the soldiers, Latin. But it was also written written in Greek. Uh, this was the what we call a common language. That was, uh, Latin was just replacing Greek um, uh, sometime before this, and was becoming um, the, uh, the the chief language. Latin, Greek was beginning to disappear. Uh, verse twenty one. <clears throat> so, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate. Do not write the king of the Jews. Um, now, <clears throat> uh, so the chief priest said this. Now, how you have to ask yourself, how do we know this? I love to ask that question. How, how, do, how do we know that? Where did this information come from? Uh, <clears throat> how, in other words, how did John know this? He writes this. How does he know this? Well, let's think about that a second. The chief priest. <clears throat> We're going to see, and it's going to be in the next program, uh, we've formed, we're going to talk about two guys, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Uh, they were both members of the Council of Israel. We call, it's called the Sanhedrin. And they would probably have been privy to these kinds of things, either at the time or some time later. Some time later. We know these people became Christians. They were followers of Jesus. And there were likely a number of others. We find at Pentecost, um, uh, there was likely other people who were priests, called priests, who became followers of Jesus. So it, this would have been probably common knowledge uh, throughout the Christian community at a fairly uh, early date. So the chief priest said of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather the man said, I am king of the Jews. Uh, they uh, took offense at the, the thing that Pilate, Pilate wrote. Uh, and you can imagine how they, they would do that. Um, but nevertheless, Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Uh, <clears throat> The Jews saw the, what he had written as a really blasphemous insult. A Philo of Alexandria, who lived somewhat after this time, but very acquainted with all of these events, would have been big news for, for many decades. He said of Pilate, by nature obstinate and stubborn. Obstinate and stubborn. And so... Uh, so that's what he has. And so he says, 
What I have written, I have written. That's it. He turned him away, just like that. Verse 23. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, uh, we know that there were four soldiers. How do we know that? Because uh, what comes next? They took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier. So, very, very clear. The text shows that. Uh, there's some indication from ancient records uh, that the execution committee of soldiers uh, that took place, took care of this, there were four. There were four of them. Um, so when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, so they've got Jesus up on a cross. Uh, there's been a number of art artistic renditions of this, and that's about all we've got. Uh, we don't know if they hoisted him up. Uh, some people say that they... Uh, they laid him down, they nailed his hands to the cross beam and then hoisted him up. Uh, a couple of big guys could have done that. Uh, there were four soldiers, they could have easily done that. Put him up on top of the saruo, the pillar, the stake. Put him up there on that and then proceed to uh, pound uh, spikes through his ankles. And there's a question about how that went. There was a little down, about a foot up uh, above his feet, well, a little apparatus. There's a technical name for it. It escapes me right now. Um, it was um, a built out a little bit, piece of wood there, uh, that the condemned person on the cross could actually kind of hoist himself up. Because what happens, uh, people would die of asphyxiation uh, because they couldn't breathe. They, they would sink and sink and sink. Well, that little thing was there and they could hoist themselves up. And what that served to do, it served to prolong the agony and the pain. It served because they inadvertently they would just do this because you're gasping for air. And then, so you can hoist yourself up a little bit. Um, so, Anyway, that's, that's a little picture. We're, we're not sure that the cross, uh, this cross had that feature or not. Uh, you'll see some artist re uh, renderings uh, when it has one. And the la they're, they're nailed together and, uh, and so on. But um, uh, at any rate, um, so that's what they did. Uh, <clears throat> Chrysostom, one of the, uh, the means the golden mouth one was a preacher some hundreds of years later. Uh, he wrote about uh, the, these clothes. He says they were the clothes of a poor man. Um, another thing I would mention right now, there's a passage in Genesis 50 verse 20 that says, God brings good things out of evil. God brings good out of evil. It's called the doctrine of concurrence in theological terms. Oddly enough, even things that are awful and that are evil, God uses for good and uses them for his glory. And here, here we see that exact thing. So they divided them into four parts, one part free soldier uh, and his tunic. The tunic, now, this was worn next to the skin. It was the, you could say it was the undergarment. And so uh, that's what, that's what they did. Uh, it was seamless. They, if you cut it up with a sword or something, they would just mangle it. So they, they weren't going to do that. Uh, they each had a piece. Um, the pieces of were, here's some possibilities of what Jesus had on. Could have had a headdress something to wear on top, not unusual in that area, uh, in that era with the sun always beaten down, very hot. Um, of course, the inner garment, the tunic that I just mentioned, an outer garment called a, a chiton, worn over, and a girdle uh, that kind of like a belt that kept everything going, and of course, the potential for shoes. So we don't exactly, he doesn't list 
uh, the the actual garments except for the tunic. Uh, and it's, the passage goes on to say at the end of 23, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Uh, notice it says it was woven. Uh, we underestimate the ancient peoples and how sophisticated they were. But they knew how to wolf together uh, fabrics, cotton, some maybe papyrus, wool. And so here it is that they, they had the capacity, but this was woven. That, that, what, that's what it means. It was somehow on some kind of apparatus that was developed and the, the, the pieces would be woven together. Uh, and it says in, in one piece from top to bottom. Verse 24, so they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lot for it, lots for it, and see who it shall be. Now, you have to ask the question again, how did John know that? How did John know? It's not a case of Joseph of Arimathea or Nicodemus, you know, right there with the, with the, with the priestly people. They're four guys, Roman soldiers. How did John get this information? Well, I guess it could only be that one of these became a Christian. Maybe two, maybe three, maybe all of them. Uh, I don't know if you remember the uh, the movie Ben Hur, uh, the uh, the great old version Ben Hur, and it seems to me that in the depiction of the crucifixion. There was a kind of a, a short, short uh, shot of one of the soldiers, and he had sort of a uh, a different look on his face, and maybe that's what was uh, attempting to be uh, to be shown there. So they cast lot for it. So they didn't tear the do ga garment, and and here's here's the thing: it says this was to fulfill the scripture, which says, "They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing." They cast lots. That is from Psalm 22, 18. One of those 332 prophecies about Jesus uh, that Canon Lydon um, um, made, uh, made a list of. Okay. And, you know, it's very interesting. Um, this is uh, Psalm 22, Psalm of David. Again, a thousand years earlier, written. And there was nothing in the life of David that we have. We have a very detailed account of David's life that there's no relevance in any part of David's life that's revealed in Scripture uh, that would make us say, oh, that's referring to that part of David's life. This happened in, in some event in David's life. No, there's, there's no such thing. It's completely out of the blue. And that's the way dozens of these prophecies are. You're reading along and all of a sudden, bammo, there's one. And it doesn't fit the context. It just does, it just stands out like a big light. So um, so for their they cast lots, so the soldiers did these things. Now we have something very interesting. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. Here they are. They're standing right there. They've got to be fairly close because they're going to be, Jesus is going to be talking to them. So they're going to be close. Tremendous amount of courage uh, that they're showing, these four women. We're going to find that John is right there, too. There's actually five people, John and the four ladies. There's some question. Maybe there's three. Uh, there's three women. It, it's hard to know. But my guess is that there were four, and my best commentators say there were four. And, and here they are. Here is Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's now looking upon her son, who is there bloody, naked, dying, very close to death at this point. And <clears throat> there, there they are, great courage to do that. Um, 
And so we know there was Mary, uh, Mary's sister. Now the question is, uh, Luke mentioned a Joanna, but um, uh, Matthew, Mark, and John do not mention Joanna. Uh, <clears throat> maybe that was a sister of Mary that we, we don't know, uh, other than what Luke says. Some say it was Salome. Um, again, that's hard to know. Mary, the wife of Clopas. We don't know anything really about Clopas. Uh, and uh, and then Mary Magdalene, uh, she was uh, one of those uh, who um, uh, anointed Jesus. Notice there are four Marys, at least four Marys. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, Mary. Uh, Miriam was the sister of Moses and Aaron, Aaron, the first high priest. And... Uh, the Mary is more of a Latin rendering of Miriam, Miriam, and a lot of Jewish women by the name of Mary. So this is not totally um, without uh, some uh, understanding. Now, Mary is there. It says, verse 26, when Jesus saw his mother, uh, you get almost the picture of a tremendous amount of suffering here suffering that Jesus experienced. When Jesus was dedicated at the temple, uh, Mary and Joseph took Jesus, and they encountered a man named Simeon. And Simeon was an old man. He was a prophet. And he said to Mary, he said to Mary um, that, uh, I'm looking for it. Uh, I'm looking for the, uh, the statement that Simeon made. Um, he said, a sword will pierce through you too. In other words, the idea was Simeon, even back there at Jesus' infancy, was prophesied by Simon that she was going to go through traumatic experience. So his mother and the disciple whom he loved, that's John, of course, standing nearby. By the way, he says he loved. This does not mean that there was a, a homosexual relationship between Jesus and young John. Not at all. Had it been, Jesus would have been killed years ago. Soon, homosexuality was not permitted. Terrible at that point. You did. Uh, no, people will try to say, well, they had they were a gay relationship. That's garbage. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. He says, gune. Gune, we get our word gynecology from that. It was a common word for woman. It was an honorific title. Jesus said that to her. Uh, at the wedding of Canaan, womb, uh, and it was also used in John 8 of the woman caught in adultery. Woman, behold your son. Behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Some people say that John lived with uh, Mary in Jerusalem for 11 years. She died at age 59. Another says um, that Mary... Uh, uh, went with John to Ephesus and was buried there. Okay, so long.